welcome. And on behalf of the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence, CSAFE, I want to uh, thank you for joining us and welcome you to this installment of our CSAFE webinar series. Today, handwriting analysis at CSAFE will be presented uh, by our staff, by Dr. Alicia Caracchieri. Alicia is the director here at CSAFE, and we're thrilled to have her bringing you the information um, and the research that we've been doing here at CSAFE on handwriting analysis. Alicia, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, we have lots of people uh, online. This is great. So the, the idea today is to just give an update on what is going on at CSAFE in terms of forensic handwriting analysis methods. And uh, before I go any further, uh, let me introduce the team. We have a pretty large team actually working on handwriting problems. At ISU, the, the two faculty members working on this are uh, my colleague Danica Oman and myself. Uh, we have two graduate students, uh, Madeline Johnson and Andrew Lim at this moment. And we're working with two undergraduates, Anisha uh, Ray from statistics and James Taylor from computer science. Uh, Professor Hal Stern from UCI is an occasional contributor to the handwriting project. Uh, we have a, a group at Cedar Crest College, actually, that with uh, whom we're collaborating, uh, Professors Lawrence Quarino and James Hammer, and an undergraduate student called Alexandra Arabio Ali. And uh, I will show some of her work today. Uh, at NIST, our closer collaborators are John Leibert and uh, Robert uh, Romatowski, who's our uh, um, program officer, contract officer. And much of the work that I'll present today, or some of the work I'll present today, was actually uh, led by Amy Crawford and Nick Berry, who were two of our PhD students here at CSAFE, who have graduated and gone on um, to the real world. So here's a bit of an outline of what I will talk about today. Uh, briefly talk about the problem, the forensic evaluation of handwriting uh, problem. Uh, talk about some of the scenarios that uh, examiners may find. Uh, one of them is comparing, you know, the one to many comparisons where you have uh, an actual pair of, uh, sorry, where you have a reference set of writers and you want, and a question document, and you want to compare that document against a given set of writers, uh, or uh, the uh, pairwise comparison where you have uh, one suspect and one uh, question document, and what you would like to know whether this particular suspect may have written that document. Uh, there's also the question of uh, large samples of writing versus small samples, uh, when you have a tiny little note, or you may have even a signature or uh, some uh, a short sentence, uh, and that's all you have to work with. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, extracting data from handwriting. So uh, what kind of data can you get from an image of a handwritten document? And I'll talk about um, the data we can get out of characters, out of words, out of lines, out of the entire document. And then I'll talk about some of the promising approaches, some of the things that we have uh, that are already kind of working and some of the things we have in the pipeline and then a few takeaways. Um, for everybody. The presentation is not going to be technical, so this is going to be mostly, this are some methods we're working on, um, this is what this method is good for, uh, this are some promising results, and uh, anybody that's interested in the technical details, uh, please get in touch and we can talk some more, but that this is not a technical presentation, it's an update uh, type of a presentation. All right. So the forensic evaluation of handwriting, this is something that I expect most of you know a whole lot more uh, about than I do. But the objective, of course, is to identify the person who wrote a question document. And uh, trained examiners, trained question document examiners, uh, look at a document and they evaluate any number of features. So they look at things such as the shape and the spacing of the characters, the slant of the characters, 
um, the position of the characters uh, relative to some imaginary line, uh, the pressure, uh, the pen pressure and the pen lift, uh, the strokes, uh, the continuity of strokes, the beginning, the ending of strokes, and many, many other uh, things. Um, at the end, of, they take some measurements, so some things may be measurable. Uh, at the end of the day, the conclusion they reach is a categorical conclusion, oftentimes uh, using some sort of a multi-point scale, like a five-point scale or a seven-point scale. Um, and uh, so the conclusion is categorical and is subjective in the sense that it is uh, driven by the expert opinion of the examiner who, after evaluating all these features in a document. So um, how accurate uh, are examiners and what's the reproducibility and repeatability of forensic uh, handwriting examination? There's been many uh, studies, some smaller than others, some better than others. Um, that have suggested that handwriting examination is reasonably, uh, it's as a, as a, as a, as a discipline is, uh, is, is reasonably uh, valid and repeatable and reproducible. Uh, recently, there was a very large, uh, well-designed black box study that was conducted by Nobles, funded by the FBI. Um, and uh, results, the study was presented at the AAFS uh, meetings this year, so last month. Um, I don't think there's anything published yet from it, but uh, these are some of the things that I got from the presentation. 86 participants, uh, each, all of these were practicing uh, uh, um, question document examiners. Each one of them performed between 20 comparisons and uh, 100 comparisons. These were all one-to-one -one comparisons, so what they uh, the, 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 the sets that they, uh, the test sets that they received included one question document and uh, several, I think it was five uh, reference documents known to have been written by the same person. Uh, some of these question documents were also written by that one person, some of them were not, so they had some made it and some not made it uh, test sets. And the conclusion, they were asked to reach a conclusion in a five point scale. Uh, the document was written, or the cue was written by the same person, probably written by the same person, inconclusive, probably written, not written by the same person, and not written by the same person. And the design of the study was really excellent. As a matter of fact, um, the, I think the, the, the idea was to enable estimation of many quantities, so the probability of a false positive uh, assessment, a false negative assessment, reproducibility that tells us uh, what's the probability that two different examiners presented with the same evidence will reach the same conclusion. Uh, repeatability, which is the probability that the same examiner presented with the same evidence at a different time will reach the same conclusion. And the Initial results seem to be very promising. Um, so I get this from the presentation at AAFS. Among the set of made it, uh, among the made it sets, uh, examiners correctly uh, classified about, sorry, 3% of the made it sets uh, were classified as non made it. And by non made it here, I mean. Uh, probably not written or not written. So those two categories. And uh, so that's pretty low. And about 8%, that's what we might call a false not negative. Uh, the false positive was a little higher at 8% apparently. Um, and this is the proportion of non-mated sets that were incorrectly classified as mated, meaning uh, written or probably written. And there were some inconclusive. So about 8% uh, of the comparisons among the made it sets uh, was inconclusive, 15% uh, inconclusive among the non made it sets. I should say, however, that I'm not exactly the, the numbers that I'm reporting here are from the presentation, but the final slide in the presentation uh, presents a lower false positive and a lower false negative um, 
rate. And I'm not exactly sure how those were computed in the end. So I am just presenting the numbers that they showed in the presentation. And reproducibility, repeatability appear to be high. And there's a wealth of other information in the study that I very much look forward to reading uh, about when the results are published. So it seems that there's something to be said about, uh, about the validity of handwriting examination, but of course, uh, you know, this is not perfect. There's, um, uh, there is some uh, probability of error. So the question is, can we pr provide examiners with additional tools that may allow them to uh, add uh, use in addition to the visual examination, and that may allow for other type of quantitative assessments of the evidence. And um, there's been many um, there. In fact, there are some algorithms already available to analyze forensic handwriting, uh, yeah, handwritten notes. Uh, I am just mentioning four that are uh, the better known, and apologies if I'm missing it. And another important one, Flash ID, perhaps in terms of use, is at least in the United States uh, popular. Uh, this is a system, this is a proprietary uh, system produced by Psyometrics, and it's really hard to beat. This is a fully automated system that identifies uh, the writer of a question document. Uh, by comparing this uh, uh, question document to a set of reference uh, documents in a database. And um, I am not going to talk much more about Flash ID, but it is highly accurate. And, um, and uh, I think it's uh, being used in uh, by many uh, organizations. FISH, uh, this is a system that's used by the United States Secret Service. And I really don't know a whole lot, a whole lot about it. The, the, so I'm not going to say much more about this. Wanda, this is uh, a European uh, system. Um, this is, again, um, a really, um, this is a really sophisticated system uh, that works the entire pipeline from acquisition and cleaning of uh, documents to measurements to comparisons and it's modular. Um, so this is a really very sophisticated system, and it was constructed to be back compatible to FISH. Uh, Cedar Fox is from University of Buffalo. This is uh, produced by Sri Hari and others. And this is actually a um, semi-automated system in the sense that um, this is like a computer-aided, uh, for examiners, this is a computer-aided uh, uh, evaluation system. The, the examiner sits at the computer and um, tells Cedar Fox what he or she would like to measure and look at, or, or what is it that they're focusing on. And Handwriter, this is the software that we have produced at Iowa State, or we're in the process of uh, producing at, sorry, at CSAFE. It's also fully automated. Uh, it's also modular, and um, it's one nice thing about it is that it is open source, meaning free. Uh, so uh, algorithms are really not meant to replace examiners. They are meant to provide an additional tool, an objective tool. Uh, they may be complementary to examiners in the sense that algorithms sometimes see things that uh, examiners may not see. And so in this sense, they add information to what the examiner is already doing. And I think from our point of view, the most important uh, thing about algorithms is that they provide a quantitative probabilistic assessment of the evidence. And why do we worry about probabilistic assessment of evidence? Because obviously at some point, uh, I hope that we agree that it will be nice to be able to move to some sort of a likelihood ratio framework, some more, more of a statistical framework to summarize the probative value of evidence. And so let me very briefly mention uh, what the likelihood ratio framework is all about. This is uh, a likelihood ratio is a one number um, summary of evidence. Um, and what, it, what the likelihood ratio does is it quantifies the strength of the evidence in favor of two competing hypotheses. 
uh, the, the hypothesis that or the proposition that is set forth by the prosecution, which is that the defendant or some specific person is the author of a question document and the proposition that is put forth by the defense uh, somebody else wrote the question document. And I should say that uh, the defense proposition uh, can vary. And so we're now, when people talk about the likelihood ratio, that's really a misnomer. There's many, num there's many different likelihood ratios one can compute in every case, depending on how this defense's proposition is framed. That's not something I'm going to talk much more about today, just a little bit. But in any event, the likelihood ratio tells us the probability of observing the evidence uh, we have observed if the prosecution is right over the probability of observing the evidence that we have observed if the defense is right. And so one thing that algorithms allow us to do is compute these two probabilities or these two components of the likelihood ratio that really we cannot compute unless we have some sort of uh, quantitatively assessing uh, the similarity between two documents. So here's a few notes. This is an aside. Um, the so the likelihood ratio, mind you, doesn't assess, does, it doesn't address the question of interest. So it doesn't say anything about the probability that the prosecutor is right or the probability that the defense is right. In order to say something about those hypotheses, the the, that refer to the defendant, the defendant did it or the defendant didn't write it, um, to decide between those two, we have to insert uh, into the analysis, if you will, our prior beliefs about HP and HD. And so um, this is the problem. This is something that the jurors are, are expected to do, not the forensic examiner. The forensic examiner is expected to offer an opinion on the evidence, not on the source of the uh, evidence, just the evidence itself. And so um, in this light, uh, the conclusions that are used by examiners are a bit problematic because those conclusions uh, talk directly about the writer. So when we say the writer, uh, it's highly likely that this person wrote this document. In reality, what we're doing is we're talking not about the evidence, but um, about what happens when we combine the evidence with our prior opinions about the two competing hypotheses. So um, that's one thing I wanted to say. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I mentioned this that the defense's hypothesis determines the scenario in which we're working. So who are the alternative writers? Are we comparing uh, the question document uh, to documents from a close set of writers? Are we comparing um, the question document to a specific uh, document? So how the defense frames uh, his or her proposition will depend on the method that is that is appropriate to uh, to address the question of source and I won't say anything else about this but I anybody that's interested uh, I encourage you to go uh, look at Hepler's uh, and others paper there's an excellent discussion about these issues um, in terms of what the different likelihood ratios are that you might be able to that you should be considering depending on the situation. So without further ado, let me uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, work we're doing at CSAFE. So we're looking at um, several scenarios and trying to develop uh, methods that are appropriate in each one, of, each one of these scenarios. We're looking at the scenario where we have a question document and a closed set of potential writers. But we're also looking at the case where uh, the author of the document could be the suspect or anybody else in a relevant population. So that's what I call an open set of potential writers. In the case of the closed set, um, the, the defense's alternative here is, um, you know, somebody in this specific group is the author, not my client. 
And this is a scenario that works well, for example, when you know that uh, the author must have been a student in a high school, for example, or individuals with access to a certain location, or members of some terrorist organization. Uh, so this is where uh, doing a comparison of the question document to samples obtained from the members of uh, each of the members of the group would make sense. But there's other situations where I have a suspect and a question document, and I ask myself, uh, could the, is it, is it possible that the writer um, could have written this document? That's the question that we, that we ask. And so the, the, in this case, the, the way to frame this problem is to ask ourselves, would we find a similar degree of similarity or will we find the same degree of similarity if we were to compare the question document to a sample, a random sample of uh, uh, documents written by uh, members of the relevant population. And so those are uh, two very different setups. And I'll talk a little bit about all of them. So let me start with the case where we have a close set of potential writers. And you have probably already heard some of this work presented at conferences. This is uh, the work that Amy Crawford and Nick Berry um, worked on a couple of years ago. Uh, this is um, what, what Amy proposed is a Bayesian approach. So this is a Bayesian hierarchical model that estimates the probability of writership. So uh, the question is, I have, so the problem here is I have a question document. I have samples from uh, a bunch of potential writers and I will compute the probability that each one of these potential writers could have written this question document. And so at the end of the day, what I have is a ranking of the, um, of the potential writers in terms of the likelihood that they could have been the author of the question document. So the, this approach relies on features that are extracted from characters, and I'll say something in a minute, but the features are then summarized into a document level value. And so essentially what we're using here is a, we're doing a document level comparison. Uh, this is one of the uh, projects. This is one of the things I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, other things we're doing is we're looking at um, character level features and uh, seeing whether we can find associations uh, to the attributes of the writer. This is the project that Anisha uh, is leading. And uh, the question is from the writing, can we tell whether the writer was a woman or a man, uh, in what age group, uh, favored the right, right hand, the right hand or the left side of the left, or the left hand, uh, and several others. Uh, and then we're working on several machine learning methods, so more algorithm. These are two very statistical approaches, and then there's, a, there's several uh, more algorithmic approaches that allow us to classify two documents into same writer or different writer. Um, and this, we have several projects ongoing in this area. One that uses character level features and uh, random forests. Another one that uses word level, fe word level features and random forests. And finally, and this is the newest uh, thing, one that uses line level features and Siamese convolutional neural nets, which is this um, mysterious thing. All right, so before we can do anything, we have to extract data, so from handwriting. And the typical handwritten sample is a two-dimensional image, so a, a digital image of a sample of handwriting, maybe like the one we have here at the right. And um, obvious, so first of all, the, the focus is on the shape of the writing, not on the content of the writing. There's of course a lot of work that is done on the content of writing, but that's not what we're looking at here. And um, the, the idea is to automate uh, this, this um, examination methods and uh, 
perhaps develop computer algorithms that can identify, take this sample of writing and uh, identify small graphical structures that may or may not correspond to letters or numbers. Um, that would be the smallest unit of analysis. Uh, perhaps it's interesting to look at entire words. So it would be nice to have a, a code, code that can separate this writing into words. And of course, uh, we might also be interested in looking at entire lines of writing. And whatever we do, uh, we can take measurements. So extract features or extract data from any uh, structure, either uh, characters or words or lines. And so um, the smallest unit of analysis would be the, the graph level, so the character level. And this is what most of the existing systems do. They decompose um, the writing into small graphical structures. And this is, for example, what Flash ID does. And they call these graphical structures graphemes. Uh, and these graphemes may correspond to word, to letters or to uh, pieces of letters or even to a couple of letters together. So these are small graphical structures. And once you have those graphical structures, then you can, um, you can characterize those graphical structures by their topology, for example. So you can look at the number of um, nodes that they have. So for example, this character over here, this is an F a cursive F, and you can define different types of nodes. So you have an initial node here, an ending node here, and then intersection nodes like this one over here, this one over here, and this other two over here. And so this is a graphical structure that has um, several nodes that are um, connected by edges, and the edges have different attributes. So for example, here you have a straight edge, here you have a loop, uh, here you have a curved edge and so on. And so that contains information about the character. And of course, you can also look at other attributes of these graphs. And so for example, you can look at the relationship between the lower loop area and the upper loop area, or the overall slant, the inclination of this character. These are all things that a computer can measure directly uh, from this type of representation of handwriting and is data that we can then use to come up with, you know, the things we want to come up with, probability of authorship, for example, and others. The code that we have, the program that we are developing at CSAFE is called Handwriter. It's written in R, which is an open, it's an open source uh, system. And it uses uh, a sequence, does things similar to what Grapheme, uh, to what Flash ID does, but is nowhere as sophisticated. So it is, um, it uses a simpler set of rules, um, but it seems to work uh, very, very nice and produces graphs like the ones I'm showing you on the left. Now, what do you do with these graphs? So after you have, so if you think of a one page document, for example, uh, a one page document may contain hundreds of graphs, maybe a thousand graphs. Uh, so lots and lots and lots of graphs. And so what are you going to do? So ideally what you, the first thing you wanna do is you might want to sort of find groups of those graphs that are similar in some way. And so uh, you might want to cluster the graphs into a smaller set of groups. Um, and so the def so what do we mean by similar here? And this is one big difference, for example, between Flash ID and Handwriter. Um, Flash ID uses the topography of the graphs to group them. And so for example, uh, these three Fs uh, would land in different groups. And the reason they would land, so these two look very similar. And so why in the world do we put them in different groups? That's because of this, there's an incidental, um, they're very different from a topological point of view. This one only has four nodes, this one has five nodes and uh, an additional edge. And so these two graphs would end up in, a, these three graphs would end up in different groups uh, if we used a deterministic, um, 
grouping system, what we use in uh, Handwriter is an, an, a, what's called a dynamic approach uh, that uses a method called k-means. Uh, if you're interested, a paper was uh, published recently. Uh, and the approach is much more flexible in the sense that, for example, these two Fs would end up in the same group. Uh, this one would end up in a different group, most likely. And so, um, the, so at the end of the day, uh, what we use is uh, this more flexible approach to grouping uh, graphs into K groups. And K here is something that one can pick. Um, and obviously this K will depend on the uh, size of documents one is, uh, one is working with. And um, it turns out this is not an easy task. So because we, to group, you have graphs and to use these graphs, you need to figure out a metric that uh, looks at the distance between the graphs so that you can put graphs that are close enough into the same bucket and graphs that are not close enough into different buckets. And then you need to be able to compute an average of each graph. And that turns out to be also problematic. So rather than talking about this, the method itself. Let me tell you, let me show you some of the results. So this is um, initially we started, we picked, we were looking at documents such as the London letter or um, a passage from the Wizard of Oz. So about a, a good paragraph worth of characters uh, where we found that on the average, there were about 350 of these graphs uh, from you know, most it varied across writers, but more or less. So it seemed that 40, uh, you know, separating those 300 and some graphs into 40 buckets of similar graphs made some sense. And so when we fixed 40 uh, to be the number of uh, clusters we wanted, this is what you obtain. And so what I'm showing you here is an exemplar in red. So that's like an anchor for each one of these clusters. And then what you see in gray is the variability. So everything in gray shows graphs that were placed in the same bucket that were similar to, that were closest to this particular exemplar than to any of the other red exemplars in, uh, in the other 39 clusters. So that's essentially how that goes. And so you can see, for example, that here is uh, this uh, cluster R, for example, contains Ns. Uh, but cluster X may also contain ends that look a little different. Um, here's a cluster A, L that contains Fs, but here's another cluster that contains F, and here's another one that may contain Fs, and yet another one that may contain Fs. So this is, um, this, uh, this is artificial. This is what the computer finds, but this is a way to um, and some of these clusters are much less variable than others. For example, this one that contains O's, the, you know, the variability around the red exemplar is much smaller than this one, for example, that contains this character with two loops and the variability is all over the place. And so some of these clusters may be more informative than others. So once we have uh, a way to cluster this, uh, this graphs, then the data that we can, one piece of data we can extract is the frequencies with which each writer contributes to each one of these buckets. And so for example, here you have 40 clusters, those are the columns. And then along the rows, I have documents and writers. For example, here we have first document written by writer one. Here I have first document written by writer 38 and so on. And I just simply count. So this, this writer one had 42 graphs in cluster one, 21 in cluster two, and so on and so forth. Um, and the question is whether the observed frequencies with which each writer contributes to each one of these clusters is informative in the sense of, can I tell who's the writer if I look at these frequencies? Uh, once I process their documents. And so here what I'm showing you is um, we have uh, three writers, writer 12, 66, and 124. And each one of these bars corresponds to a cluster. 
And uh, what the height of the bars corresponds to the frequency. Uh, this is all London letters. So the height of the bars correspond to the frequencies with which each writer uh, contributed to each cluster. And you can see that they're pretty different. Like the, the bottom one has uh, an abundance of uh, graphs just about everywhere. The top one, the middle one focuses on the first few clusters. This first one has a, a peak here in, the, in this later clusters. And so there seems to be some information. And so, um, the, so we being statisticians said, well, you know, these frequencies look like multinomial random variables. Uh, and so we can write down a model where we uh, can estimate, given the observed frequencies for each writer and each document, uh, we can fit a model and estimate the probability of, for each writer of contributing um, graphs to each one of those uh, clusters. And uh, again, no details here, but it can be done. Uh, it turns out that um, from that information, we can then compute the probability of writership. Essentially, the probability that writer, W star, let's call it, is the author of the question document using the estimated vector, the multinomial vector for that particular writer. And I, I don't know how much you can see, but it doesn't matter. So here's um, here's 90 writers uh, that we, so what we did is we took writers from the CSAFE uh, writing database, and we took uh, writers from the CVL writing database, mixed them all up, and, um, and threw them all into a model and see what happened. It turns out that results were pretty darn good. So, uh, so what we did is we held back one document from each one of those writers and used the other documents to estimate model parameters. And so given those model parameters, then we went back to the uh, 90 question documents to see whether we could correct, uh, correctly allo allocate those documents to each one of the writers. And we did pretty well. So, uh, so the, the, the blue here along the main diagonal is the correct prob so is the probability of co of um, of writer so what you what what ideally we would have liked to see is nothing in the off diagonals and only uh, probability in the on diagonal so for example for all of these writers in the middle here we got the we correctly allocated them to the corresponding question document, all of these here, all of these here. And then we have a few writers like this one, for example, that we did not. So for this writer, for, ex for this particular question document, for example, we had 9% probability on this writer, uh, some probability on the actual writer, 52% probability on uh, some other incorrect writer and so on. But as you can see, for most of the writers, we got it right. So the question is, so here's the same results uh, where you can see it a little bit better. Um, but can we improve on this? And so the next step in this particular analysis was to add graph level features. So um, if we look at the slant of writing, so here's, for example, um, one particular writer, this is our London business is good. So uh, this writer has a pretty clear slant. And the way we measure slant is by looking at the angle between the dominant direction of the character and the horizontal axis. And so we, uh, that's an angle. And in polar coordinates, those angles live between zero and two pi. So they live in a circle. And uh, what I'm showing you here is for this particular writer, all of the graphs that this particular writer contributed to this particular cluster, uh, these were some of them, for example, uh, the directions, the, the, the most of the slants were concentrated along the same direction. The, the right, the red, um, so these are the, the observed angles for this particular writer and the, the corresponding frequencies are given by this uh, blue bars. And the red distribution around that 
is called a wrapped Cauchy distribution. That's a probability model for angles that takes into account the fact that angles are restricted to live between zero and two pi. And so doing statistics with angles is not the easiest thing in the universe, but it can be done. And so let me skip this because otherwise I won't uh, get anywhere. So we combined uh, the angles with the frequency of writing and the same uh, test data set that we had used before and we greatly improve results. So now you can see that for most of the writers, uh, the probability is on the diagonal uh, and there's a few little spots here and there. So there's still like four or five writers among the 90 for which results were so-so, but in general, um, this did pretty well. So what happens when the uh, amount of writing that you have to evaluate decreases? So this is, so what we did here is we said, all right, let's use the same method, but now look at decreasing amount of writing in the question document. So what we did here is we went to the IAM database that presents, uh, that allows you to pick out sentences. And so um, we created four test sets uh, for uh, 50 writers. Um, so we had a training set. We took 50 writers out of the IAM database uh, that had six or more documents, I think it was. No, no, I don't remember. So we took um, that had, never mind. So we, for the 50 writers, we used a bunch of writing to train the model. And then we created four different test sets one with uh, four sentences, one with three sentences, one with two sentences, and one with one sentence. And, as, and so what you can see is what happened when we use the exact same method on a decreasing amount of uh, questioned uh, writing. So when we had four sentences, we did really well. When we had three sentences, we did pretty well, except for this one tiny little mistake up here. When we had two sentences in the test, in the question document, that started the, the, the performance of the method started uh, uh, getting worse. And when we only had one sentence, then it really got a little iffy. Here's the same thing that I'm showing you uh, using percentages. So when you have uh, four sentences in the test set, there were 167 uh, graphs. On, the median number of graphs was 167. But when you had only one sentence, the median number of graphs you had to work with was only 34. And remember, we have 40 clusters. So what this is saying is that most of the, a big chunk of the clusters have zero observations in them. So either we have, you can see this as either having too many clusters or having too few graphs in any event, this just doesn't work very well. And so our performance, uh, our error rate went up to about 9%, um, which is not so good. So we're working on this and uh, coming up with different approaches. One approach is to say, what if instead of looking at characters, we were to look at uh, words? And this seems unintuitive because there would be uh, fewer words than characters in a document, but the words may give us more information. And so, and so um, one of the things we're working on is trying to get handwriter to recognize words. And uh, I'm told that I have five minutes to, to speak, so I'll be quick. Uh, and once we have words, we can start playing with things such as um, different types of graphs. This is the work that uh, Alexandria is uh, working, leading. Uh, what she's proposing is using this thing called Kinesar graphs. And Kinesar graphs allow you to, uh, so what essentially what you're doing is you're taking a word, here's a word like the, and uh, creating different types of nodes. So you, you place this landscape nodes on the word. Uh, some, the green nodes represent the top most of the word, the purple is the bottom most, the blue is the beginning, the orange is the end, and then there's a bunch of pink nodes here that, uh, ref that represent intersections or where edges cross. 
and construct this uh, Kinesa triangles there's, that uh, at the end of the day may look like what I'm showing you on the right here. Now, once you have these triangles, then you can measure the daylights out of them. You can measure the area of the triangle, the number of triangles in a word, the area, the angles. Um, there's more than one triangle, so you can do statistics on edges and angles and so on. And so um, the question is, is that informative? So this is just beginning, but this is very uh, promising, I think. So here I have the word the for three different individuals that uh, and what we did is we extracted the word the from all the document, all the samples that we had. So um, each person writes the word the very often in a document. And so if you look at this person, you see that the within person variability uh, is very, very small compared to this other person where the angles are all over the place compared to this other person that's sort of in the middle. So we're thinking that we should be able to um, extract this type of data and fit models or do some sort of uh, random forest, some learning algorithm to identify writers. And if you think you've seen something sort of similar, uh, you have um, Cedric Newman and collaborators in 2015 did something not identical, but similar um, with latent print evaluation. This is a picture that uh, I took from that paper. And uh, we're looking at this particular metric D as a possibility to incorporate into our handwriting uh, methods. So other ongoing work very quickly, um, where, as I mentioned earlier, Anisha is working on writing attributes and um, writer characteristics, and she's finding some pretty interesting results. We still don't have enough data, but for example, she, uh, she finds that older writers exhibit significantly less slant than younger ones. Within the age group, women appear to show more slant than men. Uh, the region where the person got received a third year education seem, appears to make a difference. Um, so the, the strength of this, and furthermore, there's interactions. So the strength of these effects depend on the type of characters we're looking at. Um, Madeline is working on extending the multinomial uh, response model that I mentioned earlier to when we have one-to-one -one comparisons. And so what she's looking at is looking at pairs of documents and finding the way to uh, compute a distance between those documents. And so the distance, the, the difference between those documents that she's uh, using uh, consists of a K plus one vector of features. The first K features are just the differences in the multinomial proportions. And the last feature is the Euclidean distance using those 40 multinomial proportions. And she's good at getting some pretty good results. So for example, this is when you have a short prompt uh, the red here represents the uh, random forest scores uh, when the same writer wrote the two documents. The blue is the random forest scores when the different writer wrote the two documents. For the Wizard of Oz, you get better results. Of course, you have more, uh, more information. London letter, same thing. And when you combine everything, you're getting pretty good separation between the random forest scores. So this looks like it might allow us to say with a certain degree of certain of, uh, with a certain probability, these two documents were written by the same person or not. Stay tuned. The final thing I want to mention is the Siamese convolutional neural networks. Uh, this is one of those mysterious, uh, mysterious uh, machine learning methods. And essentially what these are is two coupled networks, convolutional networks. By that, I mean, you take two images, uh, here's the cute puppy and the cute kitty, and uh, the network does the processes them in exactly the same way. So using the same architecture, uh, computes vectors of, um, compute, summarizes the image into some characteristics and then compares those characteristics. And what you get up at the end of the day is a measure of similarity between the two images that you fed in. Now, how does that work for uh, handwriting? We're still investigating. Um, the picture, we 
I don't have any results to show of our own yet. This is the work that Andrew is doing. The picture that I show you below here comes from a publication in 2017. And these are two different writing samples and the red things that you're looking at. So comparing this on top with this and bottom and this on top with this and bottom. And the, the, the thing you're looking at is the red is where the uh, convolutional neural net is uh, focusing on. We continue to collect data and to produce software. So, um, and one thing that we're uh, trying to get going is a comparison of handwriter and flash ID. Um, this is uh, a project still in the works. So some takeaways. Um, it's true that there's technology and that at some point, I imagine handwritten documents will go the way of the dodo bird, but that's still not happening. Uh, and there's still handwriting evidence uh, used in cases. The Noblis black box study that was recently com uh, completed, completed suggests that uh, doc, you know, the question document examiners do exhibit uh, reasonably, reasonably low error rates, not zero though, uh, so, but reasonably low, maybe in the order of 5%, 10%. Um, and so algorithms can be valuable as the, they can, they allow the examiner, to, first of all, we can have them to carry out the one-to-many comparisons or quantify similarity between two items. Um, and so we're developing at CSAFE uh, a variety of tools. Um, the, I, the, what we, want at the end of the day is to be able to compute the two components of a likelihood ratio, the probability of observing a certain degree of similarity between two documents if they have a common source, and the probability of observing this, the degree of similarity if they have a different source. And so at this moment, we're really eager to work with practicing uh, examiners and with labs not only on testing methods, but also you know, understanding from you whether what we're doing is useful. And uh, of course, providing training in statistics that's useful for examiners. And everything that we produce, just as a reminder, is open source and in the public domain. So if you want to look under the hood, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Thank you so much. And um, that's my email address. I'd be delighted to talk with any of you and our website. And sorry for speaking so long. Thank you, Alicia. We have a handful of questions here, and um, I want to make sure that that you have an opportunity to address these first two. They were answered by other participants, um, but but the first question we got is the examiners knew they were being tested, presumably, and I believe this is in regard to the um, noblest FBI noblest noblest study. Uh, that you mentioned at the very beginning. Yeah, I am looking at the questions. So I think so, Chris. I'm not sure, but the, I, I I believe that they knew they were being tested. The person to ask, of course, would be so Austin Hicklin and um, Lisa. Um, Austin Hicklin and Jim Peters are the two people I've been in contact with about this. Um, so I think the answer is yes. Uh, then there's another question from Shreya uh, Rastogi. In the FBI Nobly study, did the examiners conduct the entire assessment themselves through visual examination? Right, they only, they did not include any algorithm. Uh, they, it was exclusively uh, real examiners that were uh, included. Um, how do you obtain the denominator for computing probability? Uh, this is a question I'm not sure that I answer, that I understand what this question means. Uh, I believe you were on slide seven when this question came in. Oh, slide seven. Okay, so let me check that then. Uh, slide seven. Oh, so that's probably the novelist. Uh, um, ah, no, this one. Ah, uh, so how do you compute the um, how do you compute the denominator? Well, it depends, right? It depends on what the what the defense hypothesis is. So, for example, if the defense hypothesis is that um, what happened to my share, if the defense hypothesis happens to be that uh, somebody else in this particular group of individuals wrote this document, then to compute the the denominator, you would only look at samples 
from that close group of individuals. So the denominator, again, depends on what the defense hypothesis looks like. Janie is asking, how do you provide for subjective view in an algorithm, which also provides for the training experience of the handwriter examiner? Well, that's just it. Uh, so <laughs> algorithms are um, dumb in one sense, uh, but uh, don't have a horse in the race in another sense. Uh, so algorithms are not subjective. And you, what you want to do is eliminate the subjectivity. Uh, so examiners, uh, obviously an algorithm is trained also, but in a different way. Um, so you don't. John is asking in the, John Welch is asking in the closed group scenario, how would a court be convinced that the writer of the question document necessarily came from that group? I wouldn't know that. Um, uh, well, you can actually compute the probability that the, you can, uh, so for example, with most methods, uh, you can compute, you can come up with a way to compute the probability that the real writer is not in your set. So um, if you think about it, one way to think about that is to look at, um, well, you need more information, but you can compute the probability that the writer is not in your set. How do you define the relevant population in an open set analysis? That's a great question. Um, the, and I don't think that I'm the person to answer that question. So um, the relevant population might be uh, all individuals that live in an area, or it might be, um, you know, uh, males of a certain age. So I think it would depend on the case. Uh, Ruth, is the purpose of these studies to ultimately eliminate uh, forensic document examiners or to make them better using the systems? I hope that nobody got the message that what we're trying to do is eliminate examiners. We're trying to provide tools that will uh, enable examiners to uh, come up with uh, quantitative assessments that right now they cannot. Um, that from Julia Layton, the testing you described is this using samples when nobody was trying to disguise, right? So as far as we know, so we have the we have a most of the data that I showed is from our own data collection, and uh, we don't tell people whether they should write like they normally write or whether they should try to disguise disguise their writer from each of the people that participate in our studies, we have multiple um, multiple samples of writing. And so it is possible that in some cases they're trying to disguise their writing. Uh, we don't know that. Um, how is the dominant direction of a graph defined? So when you have this graphs, um, the way there's many different ways to do this. The way we do this is we embed each character in a unit square. And in that unit square, each character has X and Y coordinates. Using this X and Y coordinates, we compute something called a principal component or principal components. And what we call the dominant direction is what's called the first principal component, is the direction of maximum variability uh, in that graph. So again, there's different ways to do that, but that's the way we do it. What is meant, Catherine is asking, what's meant by the edge of a character? So when you look at a character, um, let, me sh let me see if I can show you. Uh, I'll share my screen again. I don't even know if uh, Catherine is still here, but if you look, for example, at these characters, uh, let's look at the F in the middle. So the edge is any, is connects two nodes. So here we have an edge between this node and another node. Here's another edge between this node and this, and here's another edge between uh, these last two nodes. So an edge is what connects two nodes. Uh, Janie, I do not agree that handwriting will go the dodo way. <laughs> okay. um, technology is gravitating to accommodate handwriting on digital platforms. That's true. That's 
that's true too. So I take the Dodo comment out. Um, it poses different problems, of course, uh, but that's correct. Marty uh, Herman, you so you are computing the probability that a particular writer person is the writer. That's a posterior probability. That's does that mean uh, that a likelihood ratio is not needed? That's a good question. So this is the Amy approach, and essentially yes, we're looking at. Um, so what we're doing is we're doing this uh, one to many comparisons, and we're saying what's the chance that this person was the uh, what's the posterior probability that this particular writer was the author of this question document? And so, yes, in that case, we're computing a, here the posterior probability is really more of a measure of, um, uh, it's a measure of similarity. Uh, it, it's a distance metric that we're trying to compute uh, between uh, documents. We don't think about it as the probability that this particular writer wrote this particular document, rather it's how close is this writer to this document. So that's the way we're, we're thinking about it. But essentially, yes, it's a posterior probability. All right then, um, I don't even know if there's anybody with us yet. Alicia. Thank you very much for providing this presentation and, and hosting this webinar. Um, on behalf of CSAFE. Wait, wait, there's two more questions. Oh, you have more questions. <laughs> so how does the program adjust for natural variation? Um, I'm going to guess that the program you're talking about is Handwriter, but um, so Handwriter, yes. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, so Handwriter looks at, it doesn't like look at, um, so the only thing that a handwriter does is extract these characters or extract the words. What you do with those then is the statistical question. And so, yes, in order to, in order to say anything, you have to account for the fact that nobody writes exactly the same way two times in a row. And so you have to, if, if writing is informative, what that essentially means is that the within person variability in writing is smaller than the between person variability in writing. So you do have to take into account the fact that two samples from the same person are not going to be identical. And we do that, yes. And Ruth, please confirm that you said the error rate of FDEs is what? Okay, Ruth. Can you tell me what the question is? Because it didn't finish here. So I, I don't think I said much about the error rate. Oh, 5%. Um, this is what the Noblis FBI study uh, looked at, or, or some of the numbers that I gathered from that study was that about, um, 3% of the mated samples were declared to be non-mated. About 8% of the non-mated samples were declared to be mated. And there's, of course, the inconclusives that one has to worry about. 8% uh, among the non-mated samples, no, 8% among the mated samples were inconclusives and 15% among the non-mated samples were inconclusive. So stay tuned uh, for the publications coming out of that study. Thank you all for being here and we hope you have a great day. Thank you so much.